This is another example of calorimetry, and it actually corresponds to your uh, analysis for your first lab for this unit. Um, different numbers, but same idea. So, how do we know that we're dealing with calorimetry in this case? Well, I've got one substance, sodium hydroxide, mixed with another, hydrochloric acid, with a temperature change. One substance in another, temperature change, calorimetry. So, we're going to start like we did the other one. Heat lost equals heat gained. All right. So, in this, this one's a bit different. Okay, oftentimes you're going to have one substance being dissolved, another a mass of something and a volume of something else. It's a little more straightforward. So, in this case, though, we have two volumes of solution. So, and it says that temperature is increased by 10 to 10 and a half degrees. Well, what's, what is increasing by 10 and a half degrees? Uh, it's the whole solution. It's not just one chemical or another. Remember, the chemicals themselves don't actually change temperature. It's just the surroundings. So, what we're going to say is the whole entire solution has changed temperature. Okay, well, then what is the solution? So that's kind of vague. So, if you notice, these are aqueous solutions. So what are they mainly composed of? Not NaOH, not HCl, they're mainly composed of water. So the water is the surroundings, the environment of this solution, and it is what's going to be changing temperature. So then for the heat loss component, it will be the chemicals causing the reaction. So we have HCl and we have NaOH. Well, I could potentially calculate for both of them, but I'm only concerned with calculating for sodium hydroxide, and we're dealing with molar enthalpy. Molar enthalpy is specific for one substance only, so I'm going to ignore my HCl component. Okay, so as before, now we're going to identify the type of energy involved for each substance. The water is changing temperature, so it's kinetic energy. The sodium hydroxide is uh, being neutralized, it's chemically reacting. So it's potential. Now we can throw in our formulas. Again, if you are utilizing completely unit analysis, fantastic. If you're using formulas like many of you will, watch your units. You still have to work with them. So rearrange, isolate your delta HM. I mean MC delta T over N. Now what mass of solution should I use? Remember, the reason we do this step up here is so we identify all the variables appropriately. Right? I just need the moles of NaOH. I only need the temperature change of the water and the mass of the water. Well, how much water do we actually have? Well, since we are dealing with the entire solution, not just one part or another, we're going to use the total volume. So that's 35 mils which is going to be directly converted into 35 grams. Okay, so there's all my numbers. When I work this out, notice I didn't change any units. The less units you change, the better off you're going to be. The okay, fewer mistakes are going to be made. My units actually end up being joules per millimole here. Okay, with a rather small number. Actually, I don't know if it's small or not. I don't even know if that makes sense. I made up the numbers. So I have a negative 103 joules per millimole. Now you're probably not going to see those units on any sort of solution. They're fine, but you're probably not going to see them very regularly. But if I want to convert joules per millimole into kilojoules per mole, it's direct. And you just multiply top and bottom by a thousand and you end up getting kilojoules per mole. Okay. You may or may not have done that and that's okay. You probably would have changed your milliliters into liters straight away and then got joules per mole as a result and then converted it and that's totally fine. 
Okay, as long as you have the correct answer, the correct units all the way through, I'm going to be pretty happy. And of course, watch your significant digits.